In Haiti, the protests that continue to shake the country have resulted in six deaths and several injuries on Wednesday. The Iraqi government claims that the United States has become a factor of instability after recent attacks in the territory and demands the withdrawal of its troops. And in Pakistan, telephone services were suspended on Thursday as the country voted in a general election marred by allegations of border fraud and violence. Hello and welcome to From the South. My name is Belen de los Santos and from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba, we begin with the news. Protests in Haiti have resulted in six deaths and several injuries on Wednesday. Five of the dead were members of the military brigades, which recently rose up against Prime Minister Ariel Henry. Defined by various actors in political lives as an uprising, in addition to the seizure of the streets by hundreds of Haitians, looting and the burning of public institutions were reported. The number of wounded is significant, according to human rights organizations, but there are no established figures. The term of office of Ariel Henry was due to end this Wednesday and various sectors came out to demand it. The government's response was to open fire on those who claim that the premier is not capable of resolving any of the crises the country is suffering. And the people of Grenada celebrated 50 years of independence on Wednesday after more than three centuries of occupation by France and the United Kingdom. During the day, citizens participated in trade fairs, ecumenical services, as well as academic, sporting and cultural activities. Various authorities and international guests highlight the nation's performance over the past five decades, the challenges ahead and the prospects for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. At the ceremony for the military parade, the Vice President of Venezuela, Delcy Rodriguez, highlighted the heroic deeds of the people of Grenada and their progress in the process of integration in the Caribbean. Independence was achieved on February 7, 1974, under the leadership of Eric Gavey, who became Grenada's first prime minister as a sovereign state. Our theme for this golden jubilee, one people, one journey, one future, one people. At the heart of any nation is its people, driven by trials, pain, fears, hopes, dreams, and successes. On this most special day, our golden jubilee, I stand with you not only to celebrate our 50th anniversary of independence, but to honor the memories of those who have so diligently and steadfastly paved the way so that we can have a better future. Also, Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell praised the Grenadian people for their resilience and unity to build a better nation and called on them to continue on the same path to ensure a better future. So our journey, our independence journey has been one of resilience, progress, and great aspirations. And in the face of our many challenges, we have shown that unity and strength that is so magnif magnificently on display today. This remarkable journey has been the defining factor shaping the very essence of our nation. So let us continue on that journey today, fueled by determination and unity, a journey to build a better Grenada. In Venezuela, the executive vice president, Delcy Rodriguez, rejected the statements made by the president of ExxonMobil, assuring that the transnational is subrogating the sovereignty of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. The vice president indicated that the country is categorically opposed to the statements issued by Alistair Ruldech, 
president of the U.S. oil company. Caracas also qualified his statements as threatening, asserting that they encouraged the illegitimate route of the International Court of Justice to address the controversy over the Essequibo, as opposed to the Geneva agreements, which call for a peaceful solution agreed upon both parties. Venezuela also noted that the president of the ExxonMobil intends to protect its illicit operations in a sea that has yet to be delimited. And through social network, ex-Vice President Delcy Rodriguez stated that Venezuela rejects threatening statements by ExxonMobil CEO Alistair Rutledge. This energy transnational not only assumes the sovereignty of Guyana, governs the high authorities of that country, encourages the illegitimate path of the International Court of Justice to the treatment of the Geneva Agreement, but also seeks to protect its illicit operations in a sea pending to be delimited under a war warring cloak of the U.S. in complicity with Guyana. This clearly violates the Argyle Accords and international legality. Venezuela will not rest in defending Esequibo and will assert its rights in all circumstances that arise. Previously, authorities of the U.S. oil company ExxonMobil con congratulated the measures adopted by the government of Guyana which guarantee the presence of private security forces from U.S. and other countries to protect the operations of the transnational. In this context, authorities of the oil company affirmed that actions are a good prediction in the area of defense and security, not only for the country, but also for the Western Hemisphere. The president, Alistair Rutledge, stated that the border controversy between Guyana and Venezuela continues to be of concern, as well as threatening operations in the oil sector. Finally, he added that the company is allowed to contract to operate within the water yet to be delimited within the Essequibo territory. In El Salvador, commissions were set up to begin the recount of the votes of the February 4th presidential and legislative elections. Several political parties announced a series of irregularities in the vote counting process. In this context, they requested the elections to be declared null and void and, if possible, to be held again. They also pointed out that during the electoral exercise, the Supreme Electoral Tribunal had affirmed that the computer system would guarantee a speedy vote count, but after 72 hours, official results have not yet been issued. Political parties also report that the situation is serious due to the fact that authorities have found ballots in different areas of San Salvador, which proves a breach in the custody of the ballots, adding yet another irregularity to the process already described as the most fraudulent since the peace agreements. In Chile, the funeral procession for former President Sebastián Piñera began after the arrival of his remains in the capital, Santiago de Chile. On his arrival at the airport in Santiago, Chile, Piñera's coffin was received by President Gabriel Boric, his foreign minister, Alberto Van Claveren, the minister of the interior, Carolina Toa, and other members of his cabinet. From there, they began a tour to the former Congress of the Republic, where the remains of the former president will be watched over until Friday. After his family and friends bid him farewell, the former Congress will open stores to receive the citizens who want to say goodbye to the former president. Piñera's remains will be later transferred to the Park of Remembrance Cemetery, where they will finally rest. And now let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. In Palestine, after four months of the genocide of the Israeli occupation against the Gaza Strip, authorities reported several civilians killed and others wounded in a new Israeli attack. 
On Wednesday, Israeli fighter jets attacked a group of civilians while they were filing, filing drinking water in the center of Gaza. While authorities indicated that all the wounded and sick due to unhealthy conditions in Gaza, indicating that at least 11,000 must be urgently evacuated to receive medical attention. For its part, the Palestinian Ministry of Health indicated that since the beginning of the Israeli genocide, more than 27,585 civilians, most of them children and women, have been killed, and more than 66,978 have been wounded, and also more than 8,000 have been reported missing. Israel continues its advance across Gaza territory as displaced Palestinians worry about another incursion into refugee areas and wonder where they might be able to evacuate to. Our correspondent Noor Harassin gives us more details. More than four months now and apparently the Israeli army is getting ready to uh, for a new land invasion in Rafah. Why would anyone actually say this is because what we are witnessing now on the ground happening here in Rafah is just like what we witnessed over the past uh, uh, month in other areas like northern Gaza and Deir el Balah. In some highlights, the Israeli forces launched a series of Israeli airstrikes on Rafah city, on uh, Tel Sultan, the Saudi uh, neighborhood, and all of these areas are actually densely populated area full crowded of displaced people who have evacuated their homes in northern Gaza and in central Gaza for safety here in Rafah. According to the Palestinian miracle sources, 15 Palestinians were killed. Uh, six of them are uh, children and this is in the Israeli attack on Rafah, on Al Mghayir home and also other Palestinian homes in uh, central uh, Rafah. At the same time, the Israeli tanks continue shelling the eastern border between Israel and uh, Rafah, while the Israeli warplanes and drones, they are not leaving the skies of uh, Rafah. So now the Palestinians are actually a very important question. Where should they evacuate next? The border with Egypt is closed. They only allow uh, the cases of those who have dull nationalities or some residencies outside of Gaza to leave. But what will happen to more than 2.3 million Palestinians here in Gaza? Nurharazin Tirisur, Gaza. The Palestinian Ministry of Health reported on Wednesday that two youth were killed by the Israeli occupation forces in the Nur Shams refugee camp in the northwest bank city of Tulkarem. According to a correspondent from the news agency Wafa, Israeli occupation forces cordoned off the home of one of the youth family in the middle of the camp and shelled the house using Energa missiles as bulldozers proceeded to demolish and destroy another part of the house. The journalist also reported that the Israeli forces shelled the vicinity of the house before withdrawing from the camp. Ambulance crews managed to evacuate the bodies of two youth from inside the targeted house. The Palestinian Prisoner Society said on Wednesday that the number of administrative detainees in Israeli occupation prisons reached 3,484 at the end of January, including at least 40 children and 11 women. The statement indicates that occupation authorities have issued more than 3,400 administrative detention orders, including new and renewed orders since the beginning of its comprehensive aggression against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank on October 7th of last year. The number of children in administrative detention reached at least 40, the number of females reached 11, and the number of journalists who have been transferred to administrative detention reached 21, including a female journalist. A senior Lebanon-based official in mil Palestinian militant group Hamas says that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's continued pursuit of the war in Gaza showed the goal was genocide against the Palestinians. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's insistence on continuing the aggression totally confirms that the goal of the aggression on Gaza is genocide against the Palestinian people. We will exert every effort to protect our people, whether through the resistance on the ground or through political efforts to stop the aggression. In this context, Osama Hamdam, senior, senior Hamas official, reaffirms its commitment to the people of Palestine, working to improve their situation and alleviate their suffering. 
In the context of following up on the ideas we presented and our commitment to achieving the best results that serve the interests of our people, alleviate their suffering and stop their pain by putting an end to the aggression against them and by ensuring complete relief through the lifting of the siege and facilitating the reconstruction process, a delegation from the movement's leadership led by Dr. Khalil al Haya, a member of the movement's political bureau, would travel to Cairo to pursue these matters on the Qatari-Egyptian sponsorship. The government of Yemen launched six anti-ship ballistic missiles towards the Southern Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. In an official statement issued on Wednesday, the African nation's armed forces announced that two military operations were carried out in the Red Sea against the U.S. ship Star Nastia and the British ship Morning Tide. The Houthi armed forces confirmed that the naval missiles had impacted both ships. On the other hand, the United States States Central Command assured that in spite of the impacts, the two ships are operative and have continued towards their destinations. Yemen's army announced on November 2023 the deployment of an operation in the Red Sea to block shippings to Israel in rejection of its siege against Gaza. The government of Iraq has referred this Thursday to the second attack perpetrated against its territory by the United States and assured that they have become a factor of instability. The Iraqi government denounced that continued U.S. bombings of pro-Iranian militias has caused the international coalition to become a factor of instability that could drag Iraq into a cycle of conflict. The attack claimed the life of Abu Bakir al-Sadi, a senior member of the Iraqi resistance, and at least two other people. Just 12 hours earlier, Defense Office spokesman John Kirby acknowledged that they had provided inaccurate information about the first attack. In view of the gravity of this fact, Yahya Rasul, spokesman of the Iraqi Prime Minister, assured that with this act, Washington demonstrated that it disregards the security and lives of its citizens. Now we have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English-speaking audience, you can scan the QR code on screen to join directly and also share the link to reach more people. Constant news coverage of Latin America and the Caribbean as well as the rest of the world. Stay connected and informed with Telesur. Now we have a final short break, don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. In Pakistan, telephone services were suspended on Thursday as the country voted in a general election marred by allegations of voter fraud and militant attacks. The government took action after 26 people were killed in the Baluchistan region on Wednesday. They interrupted mobile phone services and deployed large contingents of security personnel. In this way, they were trying to guarantee an election day with 128 million voters in peace. However, in less than eight hours, two attacks were registered. In one of the attacks, a security agent was killed. And in the last one in Kaluchi, in the northwest of the country, at least five policemen were killed. The suspension of the cell phone services drew condemnation from political parties and candidates contesting the elections, who said it meant that there would be little accountability for actions taken at the polling stations and increased concern that the elections would be neither free nor fair. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, embarked on a poignant journey through Sudan, where he met with the families torn apart by the devastating conflict ravaging the nation. With conflict raging in Sudan for the past 10 long months, the scale of displacement is staggering, with nearly 8 million people uprooted from their communities, both inside and outside Sudan's borders, seeking refuge in neighboring countries such as Chad, South Sudan, Egypt, Central African Republic, and Ethiopia. During his visit to Ethiopia and Sudan, Grande witnessed the heartbreaking realities faced by internally displaced families. In Port Sudan and Kasala, East Sudan, he listened to the, their stories, giving them a voice and calling for urgent support from the international community.
Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev secured a fifth consecutive term in elections on Wednesday, winning 92% of the vote with a 67.7% turnout. The result was a predictable landslide by Aliyev rivals have alleged fraud. The elections were called a year early following Azerbaijan's recapture of the Nagorno-Karabakh region from Armenian separatists last September. Several thousands of Aliyev's supporters gathered on Wednesday evening in the streets of central Baku to celebrate his re-election, singing patriotic songs and holding signs with messages such as Karabakh Liberator and We Are Proud of You. The six other candidates who ran were little known and had praised Aliyev as a great statesman and commander-in-chief since they announced the election in December, a year ahead of schedule. On Wednesday, several thousand people gathered in front of the Slovak parliament in Bratislava to protest criminal code reforms. The changes which prompted a wave of anti-government protests include easing the penalties for corruption and economic crimes. The parliament is expected to pass the controversial for reforms via a fast-track legislative procedure on Thursday, a step that has drawn condemnation from the president and opposition lawmakers. In its overhaul package, the ruling coalition also plans to abolish a specialized prosecutor's office that oversees cases of high-level corruption, which the coalition alleged has treated it unfairly. The topic of the criminal code reform is expected to influence the results of the upcoming presidential election scheduled for March. And like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Telesor English, my name is William de los Santos. Thank you for watching.